you know, the market had really dramatically changed during the PlayStation 2, and you know, M-rated content emerged as a huge thing. We'd done only exclusively E-rated content, and we felt like it's useful to move, and it's useful to go somewhere new and have new experiences. And I think that was something that we were pretty clear on, that we knew we were gonna do Sly 3, and then we were gonna go do new IP. So pitching a game to Sony is a pretty cool deal, because what you do is you, you, you make this pitch book, right, that's filled with pictures and some words describing, you know, how great your game would, is gonna be on faith they kind of say, okay, let's do it, based on just their gut emotional reaction. Which at the time I thought was totally bonkers, to be honest, like this huge project based on the small book. But that gut emotional reaction is what matters. We pitched actually a, a bunch of different titles. We pitched a game uh, that was called Nasty Little Things, where you kind of collected little creatures and went on adventures with them. And they were actually summoned at, off of his tattoos. We had four games that we had trotted out to them, one of which was called Uncharted. We also pitched a game uh, that by coincidence was called Uncharted. I think all of us were watching Lost at the time. We'd always wanted to make a dinosaurs game and ours was set on an Uncharted island and so we happened to call it Uncharted. It was about this guy who wakes up on this island that happens to be filled with monsters. They didn't take it. We were still an external third party, right? So we are not part of the Sony family at the time and I think they looked at it and they said, yeah, no, I don't think that's the one for us. It was just a strange, I think, coincidence at the time for them. People to really ask would be the Sony guys who were in the meeting, you know, like, how, were they freaking out? I have no idea, but they, they, were, they, had very, they had very calm faces when they presented us. I don't think that Sony said, you know, Naughty Dog, we've got a great name for your product. Oh, we had no idea whatsoever. Uh, we had no idea what they were working on, so it's completely coincidental. And there, there was nothing malicious. I'm, you know, it's it's just, it's it's a word, dude. The Naughty Dog game was already in development, but in sort of a bizarre synchronicity. Um, we were obviously thinking in similar areas at the time, but uh, we ended up doing uh, what became Infamous. The original pitch for the game that became Infamous was called True Hero, where you had to make these decisions. And then we had some other superhero things that had a little bit more of the kind of golden age look to it. And I think that we ended up in the universe of some of those other pitches with the morality and decision making of what we called True Hero. We wanted to make a superhero game. A lot of that came from us being comic book nerds, right? I mean, if you grew up reading them and you view them as high art, you kind of want to contribute to that, that genre. You know, most, if not all, superhero games at that point had been based on linear IP, either comic books or movies or whatever. And we really felt like nobody had ever said, hey, what would a superhero that was designed for a video game, what would that be? What would the power sets be? What would be the interesting constraints? How would they move? And we really felt like that was something that, that was worth exploring. All of us had played through uh, Grand Theft Auto, and we thought, well, this is a great game. I wish I could fly. I wish I were a superhero. You know, we're like, all right, great. Let's make the open world superhero game. You know what video games are, right? Like, there's this illusion of choice, but not really. By having it be open world, it said, the powers can be big. You can do big things. And we're just going to try and keep up with you. And we transitioned off of Sly, which was a huge change spiritually for the team. There were a lot of artists here who you know, were central and, and a huge part of what we did on Sly that weren't interested in making a realistic game. And so you know, those people left, and we loved them, but it just wasn't their path. On Infamous One, uh, the studio wasn't especially big. It was like 40 people. The biggest challenge was kind of getting a city made with art department that wasn't especially big. The art team was like 15 people. We'd never done a streaming game. We'd never done a game with real people in it. We'd never done traffic. And we'd never done any kind of systemic you know, crime systems throughout the world. The AI systems were so different. You know, and I'm sure Nate was panicked about what's the core tensions of the gameplay. And But I just remember being borderline overwhelmed for the first year of that project with how are we ever going to get all the stuff to load? How are we ever going to get all the pedestrians and pathing to work? I remember trying to find the character of Cole McGrath and I remember a distinct design meeting where one of the artists, Bart, came into the meeting that day with this idea that what if we made him a bike messenger? That was a really, I thought, great idea. It was somebody who really belonged in an urban landscape and who most people avoid eye contact with. But at the same time, they're kind of cool. And I remember that day being like, okay, there it is. You know, that was one of those moments where you're like, he is gonna be a bike messenger. That is a perfect idea. Cole McGrath was born.
the original sort of like, what is your fantasy for having superhuman abilities? We talked a lot about, could you pick up a car? Could you stop an onrushing train? What are those things? But as we started prototyping some of those kind of more um, iconic ideas, what we found was that smaller basic things really mattered. We love jumping down on people and, and, and having things happen. And so we just retold those with sort of electrical fiction and they became part of what coal was. It wasn't like this singular moment where we said, hey, it's, it's electricity. It was among a series of powers that we were exploring. It had one hugely defining attribute, which is that it was beautiful. You know, what do video games do really well? And that's like blasting at things. And lightning's great for that, right? Because it kind of hits people. Everyone understands it. And as we got deeper into it, we thought, oh man, this is fantastic because you interact so fundamentally with the city and by, by harnessing electricity, you could bring the city back to life. And then, if we did that, then you could suddenly go into areas of town where there wasn't electricity and it would be much more difficult. And it didn't feel like we'd invented that, it felt like a very natural progression, and so it didn't feel like a game, it felt like an experience. And you know, it's a combination of gameplay, narrative, and technology that all have to come together to make that work. And electricity was the, the fixed point that really helped us get there. Well, climbing in the game came from two things. On Sly Cooper, we made these kind of open world areas and we let players climb their way out of guards kind of perception. And it was pretty cool, but we wanted to kind of like go further. And uh, the second real motivation for uh, climbing in Infamous were those parkour videos that those Russian kids made. You know what I'm talking about? Where they're like jumping around these old bombed out factories and they were just super cool. And you're like, oh, we gotta make a video game about that. So thank you, Russian kids. <laughs> they were cool. Parkour was probably five full rewrites, like throw away the code and try again. Um, we had so many different attempts at the climbing systems and tried so many different approaches to that. Just that one idea was, I think probably two years of Chris's life was just climbing. It's just the way that project went, it was a long, arduous process. And we didn't really know how big a game we were making at the time. We always try to be careful to define our criteria for success before the title comes out because it can be a little bit of a, you know, the goalposts keep receding as you think, oh, well, that was what we wanted. Uh, we really wanted more. And so I think that on any new intellectual property, the critical thing for us was that we made a profitable title so we could pay profits to our employees and that we got to make a sequel. And that happened. And so I, that was our definition of success. Upon the release of Infamous One, the thing that really kind of stuck with me. I was I was going to E3 and I was wearing an infamous shirt. I was on the, the subway in LA and this random dude comes up to me and says, oh, infamous. Hey, that's a good game. That was it. I didn't say that I worked on it. I just thought, well, that is super random that this dude would just make a point of telling me that. That was my favorite thing that I got.